for this invitation um, to, to celebrate and to reflect on the Europe's 50th uh, anniversary. It's nice to see that in Ireland, anniversary is uh, still a reason for celebration, even 18 months after the effective date, although I'm not sure, recent, judging from recent polls, that um, in this country, late celebrations are, are really particularly beneficial uh, uh, to Europe. In any case, uh, um, I would like to give you my, my views about um, what happened, I mean, what are the problems with Europe and uh, what could be the, ways, the way forward um, and, and share with you some of the challenges that, that we have in front of us. Now, <clears throat> typically on the day after the 50th anniversary, most people tend to fall into depression. Uh, and to avoid it, they first uh, have a medical checkup, then they go on a diet, and take up some new sports. I know it because uh, uh, that's what I've been doing the last couple of years. Now, one of the things I feared most after having turned 50 uh, for my own future was to be affected by uh, so-called cognitive dissonance, which is a, a disease that many people uh, develop uh, after, uh, as they grow older. Now, you start reminiscing about the good old days, but in reality they weren't so good after all. You tend to remember only the nice things from the past and see it all through rose-tinted glasses. As for the rest, well, you forget and suppress it. And this is where nostalgia comes from. In the end, people think that the past was much better than the present and much more pleasant than what the future would be. So they like to return to the past, their own past. And they become afraid of change, and in turn increasingly pessimistic. And it's a bad, terrible way to grow older. At 50, Europe might be affected by the same thing. And it's not surprising because about 36% of Europe's population is over 50. And it, this proportion is increasing every year. And Europeans seem to be nostalgic about an irretrievable past and increasingly afraid about the future. They tend to see developments over the years in a quite different way from the reality. And one of the victims of this syndrome is the European Union. But the ultimate victims, in fact, might be the Europeans themselves. I will not elaborate on the theory of cognitive dissonance, but I will provide some examples of the symptoms and the potential implications for our common future. And we consider four symptoms. The first is amnesia. In other words, Europeans seem to have forgotten what the European Union is about, assuming that they knew in the first place. The second symptom, which derives from amnesia, is the lack of consistency, which induces to associate facts and events that occur at the same time, but which are in fact unrelated. The third symptom is myopia, which gives people a distorted view of the world around them, and thus the impression that nothing changes over time. And the last symptom is denial, in particular concerning people's own vitality. So I will look at these four syndromes and how they apply to Europe. Let me start with the first symptom, amnesia. And people in Europe tend to forget what the European Union is all about. And it's not even clear whether they knew, whether they know enough about it. And this is a long-standing problem and has never really been tackled. The fact of the matter is that our citizens have little idea of what the EU is and how it functions. And this lack of awareness can easily be exploited, and indeed has been exploited, to paint a distorted picture of the Union. Now the picture that people have uh, in Europe shows the member states and the Union almost as opposing forces, rather than forming that the former coming together to make up the later. When the Union makes a decision, it somehow looks like it was a third entity, so-called Brussels, who took the decision, rather than the representative of the member states. In fact, the main decision body, the main decision-making body in the EU, 
is a council which comprises representatives of the member states elected at the national level. Now, the same can be said about the European Parliament, which is directly elected by the people, and also the Commission, which consists of persons appointed by the governments of the member states. Now, when the Union takes a decision, it is in fact the member states who take a decision through procedures which are established by the Union, involving, of course, majority procedures and, and voting modalities. Now, when the Union fails to take a decision, it is ultimately the member states who fail to do so, either because they don't want to, they don't want to or because they don't gain enough majority in support for a proposal. Now, the Union is often accused of excessive regulation and interference. Now, whose fault is it? It always seemed to be the fault of Brussels bureaucrats. But they are not those who decide on regulation. They, at most, make formal proposals. It's often the governments and agencies of the member states which ultimately are responsible for creating excessive regulation. They are the ones that add extra conditions to take into account national circumstances or create exemptions on special regimes which go beyond the requirements of EU directives when transposing them into national law. Now, the confusion is compounded when accusations of overregulation come from those who attended the council meeting that led to a particular decision, sometimes just afterward. Voting in favor of a measure in Brussels and then criticizing that same decision once back home is a favorite sport in Europe. And no surprise that European citizens are totally confused. Now, the Union is often accused of immobility, of not being able to decide. But if the Union doesn't decide, it is because the Member States don't decide, or more often because the Member States don't want the Union to take decisions. And I will come back to this later issue with some concrete examples. The one misrepresentation is about the competence of the Union. They are much more limited than what people in general think but they are often at the heart of a misunderstanding and frustration that the Union creates. And let's be more concrete here and give you some examples. I understand one of the reasons for some people in Ireland voting against the Lisbon Treaty was the fear that Brussels, that is, the other member states, would decide on taxation in Ireland. <coughs> now, it should have been clear that decisions on taxation cannot be taken without the unanimous consent of all the member states. Now, these fears and similar ones about transfers of specific powers are totally unjustified. Now, overall, the range of the, union's comp the, of the union competence is quite restricted. In the economic sphere, for instance, with the exception of monetary policy, the competence of the union are limited to coordination of the member states' policies. Again, one of the issues raised in Ireland by the opponents of the Lisbon Treaty seems to have been the EU's inability to deal with the economic problems facing ordinary people, in particular income and employment. And the usual motto was, Europe is doing nothing to help us out. But protecting people's income and livelihoods in, is a competence of the Member States, not of the Union. While it's certainly an objective of the Union to achieve high living standards and high employment, as the treaty says, the instruments to achieve these objectives are in the hands of member states. If you think about taxation, welfare, education, research and development, uh, product market regulation, these are competences of the member states. The union has only a coordination uh, 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 competence, which is very vague. So people should know more about the competences which have been transferred to the Union, like monetary policy, for instance, which is conducted by the European Central Bank, and those competences that have remained in the hands of the Member States. The confusion, which is at times exacerbated by the Member States themselves, penalizes the Union, which is perceived as being overpowered. Another example is in the energy sector. In the face of recent uh, increase in energy prices and the overdependence of European countries on a limited number of suppliers, numerous calls have been made from all corners of Europe in favor of a European energy policy.